I convinced you to come out two weeks or three weeks ahead of schedule to come to Cape Barren Island with us to do the, the surveys. What do you think? Was it, was it worth coming out early? On January 1st, 2020, I packed a small fraction of my belongings into a backpack and a suitcase, and I flew by myself to Tasmania, Australia. I was flying halfway across the world to expand my scientific knowledge, to get some hands-on experience as an avian technician, and to learn something about sampling shorebird populations in an effort to help conserve them. After a few days of adjusting to the Southern Hemisphere, I made my way to Cape Barren Island with avian researcher Dr. Eric Wooler and honors student Laura Smith. We got some food from Woolworths, reviewed the area we would be surveying, drove for several hours, waited out some stormy weather, and then boarded a small six-seater single-engine Cessna plane. The plane was cramped and made my belly turn. My fear of flying, however, was silenced by the roaring engine and the constant buzzing of a fly that had unintentionally found himself to be a passenger. My thoughts raced with expectations and excitement, but there was nothing that could have prepared me for the view once the rolling white clouds cleared. thought that I would be here, I don't even think I could point to Cape Barren Island on a map, but I feel so fortunate. Cape Barren Island is a remote island off the northeast coast of Tasmania, an island to the southeast of Australia. The indigenous name of the island is Chuana, and it can only be reached at the invitation of the indigenous community who recently got handed back this land by the Tasmanian government. Cape Barren Island um, was returned to us in 2005. Um, since then we've had people from mainland Tassie move back home to be on country. Um, we were funded for the Truwana Ranger program on Ireland um, in 2015. Um, we were established and we've been working on country ever since. It's about 78,000 hectares was returned um, along with some of our outer islands prior to that. So uh, we also have Clark Island, Chapel Island, Badger Island, Big Dog Island, Babel Island um, and Waibalina. So Waibalina was where they took our old people from mainland Tassie, rounded them up and put them there on a mission, built a settlement there for them. A lot of our people died there um, and about the last 20 remaining people were relocated to Oyster Cove down the south of Tassie. We're slowly getting used to having our land back. We're so used to having everything taken from us. It's uh, about um, getting in touch back with country now and um, finding out what we do have. Eric's here with us doing um, a shorebird survey so we get an idea of where all the shorebirds are around Cape Barren. Um, and breeding areas, areas of significance for those shorebirds. And we're interested in that for future management of those areas. So to keep people out and motorbikes out during important breeding seasons. Uh, we're mapping all the breeding territories of 
uh, our, our beach nesting birds, there's two species of plovers, there's two species of oyster catcher, and two species of terns that nest on beaches. And the project is looking at mapping the distribution, coming up with believable estimates of population abundance for all of these species in Tasmania. We know already from the work that's been done uh, nationally around the Australian coastline that these species uh, are decreasing very rapidly on the mainland because the human population is increasing all the time. And we now believe that Tasmania is now the refuge for at least three of these species and that um, the, popula the populations in Tasmania represent potentially half the world's populations for the two oyster catchers and the hooded plover. So it's, it's clear that even from our uh, initial surveys that Tasmania and the offshore islands around Tasmania are critically important for the long-term survival of these species. We're here for about 10 to 12 days. We're going to try and get out to some of the smaller islands around Cape Barren Island. Uh, we know that these islands have got nice sandy beaches. We know that there are birds nesting on those beaches. So they'll be part of the mapping, part of the population estimates uh, for these species. So the idea is that we have a more complete or as complete as possible data set for each species that we possibly can. Over the next few days, we walked miles of shoreline, each section vastly different from the rest. Some boasted soft white sand with vivid blue water to contrast, and I couldn't believe the serenity. Some shorelines were highly vegetated with various grasses, shrubs, or eucalyptus trees. Some had incredible sights of mountains reminding me of home. Others had giant granite rocks with fiery so lichen many. growing on them. The only thing that each area of shoreline had in common was that not a single person could be found. We were the only ones along the miles and miles of land we walked. Not a single plastic scrap could be found and not a single breath of anything that wasn't wild and independently evolved for this natural paradise. It's been really interesting um, to come to Cape Barren Island because even though I've lived in Tasmania all my life, I didn't really know what Cape Barren Island was really like. And it's been a really incredible experience actually. Um, both from an ecological perspective and also um, being able to meet the community here and be welcomed so warmly by the Truana Rangers. We're very fortunate here on Cape Barren Island that um, this is an island that ha was handed back to the Indigenous community about 15 years ago and we're very fortunate that the Indigenous community is wholly supportive of what we're doing here. So they're providing us with accommodation, they're providing us with logistic support. Anything that we need for these surveys to be completed um, is being provided to us. They're just so uh, happy that we're here doing the surveys, doing the research. Our accommodation on Cape Barren Island were camp stretchers with sleeping bags set up in different corners of an old schoolhouse that the Toronto Rangers used as their office and were nice enough to let us stay in for the duration of our surveys. And there was a small kitchen in an adjacent room where we were able to store and cook our food. It was a comfortable place to stay with frequent visits from Truana Rangers Fiona and Terry. And with prominent reminders of the rich connection that the indigenous people have with the land here. We're bringing our kids up at school to learn and know their country so that they're comfortable with management into the future as they'll be the custodians then. So we teach them as much as possible about Cape Barren itself, yeah. To continue um, culture into the future. Um, so from Cape Barren here, um, shell stringing originated from here. So um, that's gone back for generations. So it's important that we teach young girls about the shells, where to collect them, um, how to prepare those shells, what seasons, um, in the water, out of the water, where we gather those shells. All of us can go along a beach and pick up some shells and string them on a cotton, but with um, the shell stringing that's originated from here, it's all the knowledges that go with it. Um, and a lot of those knowledges are kept secret um, until we have a young girl or teenage girl who's interested in it and then we'll mentor them and teach them all those knowledges that go with 
um, stringing those shells. That's the last part of it, yeah. Um, we're introducing um, traditional cultural burning back on country here. So um, Cape Barren has suffered a lot of wildfires in the past. So we've introduced cultural burning, which is done in a mosaic way. Um, later in the afternoon burning with follow up of rain for regeneration. Uh, keeping the canopies of the trees and the shade on the ground for animals and homes for birds and what have you. Cape Barron's probably three quarters heathland with some blue gum forest, she oak forest. So there's different times a year those areas need to be burnt. And the idea is that we put a cool burn in that will just trickle through the landscape as water would trickle through the landscape. Uh, leaving behind vegetation and pockets of habitat uh, for animals rather than moving them right out of the area with wildfire. The results of the survey is at the end of this particular summer um, I'll be preparing a report uh, on the distribution, on, on the numbers of birds that we found and start coming together with some management ideas and management strategies options for the community to protect the values that are present on these beaches so that we can come back in 10, 20, 30 years time into the future and these birds will still be here, the, 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 the foreshore will still be here and future generations of Cape Barren um, community and other researchers will still have the opportunity to appreciate the birds here on the island. The single biggest threat that our beach nesting birds face, not just here on Cape Barren Island, not just in Tasmania, not just in Australia, but globally, is that sea level rise will change the distribution of our beaches. They'll change the shape of our beaches, they'll change the size and the extent of beaches going into the future. So it's important for us to know now what the habitat preferences are for these beach nesting birds so that we can manage our beaches, we can look to protecting those values that the birds need to breed, to feed, to roost. And so it's part of a, it's part of a, a, a local jigsaw puzzle, it's part of a national jigsaw puzzle, it's part of a global effort to make sure that we have coastal habitat for our beach nesting birds. Many people don't realise that the beach in itself is a habitat in itself for, uh, for birds. I've had many people tell me that there's no way birds can nest on a beach because there's no trees here or no shrubs here. They don't appreciate the fact that these birds lay their eggs on the ground. Um, and it's a, it's a problem all around the world. We need to close off some beaches. We need to make sure that we stop vehicles from getting in, horses, dogs and, and people so that there isn't that disturbance. People aren't accidentally crushing eggs. People aren't accidentally uh, separating parents from their chicks. The coast is a habitat in the same way that rainforest, woodland, grassland are habitats and there are birds that have adapted, evolved uh, specialisations to, uh, to live in those, uh, those habitats. And so our beach nesting birds can only live here on beaches. We need to make sure there are beaches in the future for these birds to survive. Any, anyone can make a contribution to the conservation of our beach nesting birds. If you go to a beach and there's a sign that says there's sensitive breeding habitat, please don't enter, or keep your dog on a lead, or if a beach has been closed to four wheel drive vehicles, obey the signs. Those signs aren't there just to annoy people or to make people angry. They're there because there are birds nesting or feeding, or there's something else about that beach that's critically habitat be it for birds, even for turtles. We know that many turtles are facing the same threats. They lay their eggs in the sand on a beach. They're facing the same threats that many of our beach nesting birds are. So really it's one of compliance. If you see a sign that says, please don't enter, you know, it's a nesting habitat for a bird or for a turtle or something else. If there's an area that's closed off or keep your dog on a lead, you know, you can still take your dog along the beach, but it says, keep your dog on a lead, keep your dog on a lead, and that'll be your contribution. And if everyone did the right thing, if everyone agreed, uh, complied with the signs and, and followed the directions, we wouldn't nearly have as, as big a conservation problem as we do now. The weeks spent on Cape Barren Island were rich, filled with knowledge about ecology and a deeper understanding of the history of this land and its people. I spent my time learning about incredibly diverse shorebird species and their complex interactions and ecology. My understanding of the natural world deepened 
and so too did my love for the little bits of nature I found everywhere around me. From the moonlit waters after supper to my first sightings of a dolphin that brought me to tears. Discussions with Eric and Laura left me feeling less alone on my pursuit to protect and understand the vast number of life forms that I knew were threatened with extinction. The experience taught me to think like a scientist and also reminded me of the importance of questioning and reminded me that some of the most important lessons came from outside of the classroom. They came from walks through the rippling turquoise masterpieces that interwove themselves like cloth canvases into what was the Tasman Sea. They came from getting to know a person just a little bit better, and they came from getting to know myself, a process that often proved more insightful while outside. And so I asked the question that interested me most among all other questions, which was, why was I so drawn to conserve the natural places that I knew, and even more the ones I had just barely visited. Perhaps it was an aesthetic beauty or nostalgia. Deep down though, I knew it was something much deeper. I didn't seek to conserve along the lines of textbook phrases. It wasn't for solitude, aesthetic, or utilitarian value, but rather something more deeply rooted in the experience of being a human being on this planet. It was for an undeniable love for the places that connected me back to the present moment. And it was for an unexplainable realization that the world would be a better place with more birdsong. I think one of the first steps um, anyone needs to take is to get in touch back with country. Um, the land has the capacity to heal us. You deny yourself, you're feeling a bit down, you go for a walk along the beach or into the bush and you don't think about anything other than the moment and I think that's the power in our land. It's just living a stress-free life, back on country, feeling connected, not having all those town stresses of waking up thinking what are you going to do today. You wake up here and think what a beautiful day. Yeah it's just uh, hasn't been a boring moment. A remarkable island. Uh, we've been here for 10 days and we're flying home in the morning. Um, I think everyone has just been so welcoming and so accommodating and so helpful in you know, providing anything that we need. We've seen some remarkable birds. We've, we've even had a beach wash whale on, on the beach. Uh, we've seen some banded birds that we know have come from the other side of Bass Strait. It's, you know, and we've walked what do we say, 50, 53 kilometres you know, of, of beaches surveyed uh, in about six or seven days. So we've managed to do a remarkable amount of work in a very short period of time. Um, had a few bad weather days, but we've achieved a hell of a lot in the time that we've had. I think for me, perhaps the most remarkable thing about the island is that we can, we can drive you know, 15, 20 minutes or as much as an hour or, in, or we're on the east coast and we've got the beaches to ourselves. You know, we're the only people on a beach that might be 10, 15, 20 kilometers of, of beach. And the beach is clean. Uh, we've got birds around us and there's no one else in sight. We, we, we have that beach, it's our beach. And the other thing is we've done a lot, well, I've done a lot of surveys elsewhere around Tasmania and the response by the birds here compared to elsewhere is that these birds are clearly far less experienced or exposed to human activity on beaches. We're seeing a much stronger reaction to our presence by these birds on these beaches than we will on you know, beaches you know, elsewhere in Tasmania. And that reinforces how little influence, how little impact humans have had on the wildlife on this island. It really is still wild. Now wonder where we seem to be More concerned with our flags and nationalities Or than we are with unity or love More concerned with our differences And differing gods above and not of all these books that I forgot Drawn way 
too harsh and worries of what I'm not saying how this feels when it comes to comes to being close to you.